So, yes, um, hello, uh, everybody. This is uh, the continuation of the convergence lecture. Um, it's a little bit different, as those of you who are online will have discovered by now. It's uh, a hybrid event, and I think it's the first of these uh, lectures that we do in this hybrid way. So many of us from the Center for Translation Studies, um, staff, students, uh, we are in this beautiful lecture hall, and we uh, greet everybody who is online. I can't see you, but um, uh, I don't know my own echo, which is also <laughs> Okay, and um, yeah, now I really have a big echo. But uh, it's gone. Really. It's gone. Okay. <laughs> yes, the echo is gone. So, um, yes, with us today here in Guildford uh, at the University of Surrey is Professor Michael Carl from Kent State University and uh, in Ohio. And uh, so, Michael, we are very, very pleased to welcome you uh, not just to the convergence lecture, but to be here with us for quite a few days and uh, to be with us face to face that is something we haven't really been able to do in a long time so it's all the all the nicer um do i need to introduce you i don't really think so but i would like to um so we are very pleased to have you here um michael as you all know has been uh, involved in uh, translation process research for decades i think several decades <laughs> yes i would think so um, one of the leading figures in this field, Michael has, of course, as also many of you know, been uh, a key, has had a key role in developing the um, translation process research database, the Translog tool, which um, I'm also sure that uh, many of you who are out there online uh, know and have used for research or are hoping to use for research. And today, um, uh, Michael will, of course, um, and that's what I particularly look forward to, um, uh, demonstrate to us, that's my understanding and my reading, and that's already bringing us close to it, uh, the understanding that we have and how we process data in translation. So we'll, um, of course, demonstrate to us how the meticulous um, empirical process research that um, the tools that you have uh, developed enable us to do also leads to theory building, theory formation, and how that all comes together as part of cognitive translation process research. So I hugely look forward to this, and I will hope that uh, my only hope is that you also leave us some time at the end to have a good uh, question and answer. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, really a pleasure. And uh, so when we discussed about the uh, topic, the theme of this presentation, uh, this title came up, what have we learned from empirical translation process research? And I was thinking about this uh, a few, uh, quite some time, and instead of enumerating a large number of small details, I was thinking I give a broad overview over the history, 40 years translation process research, and then talk about uh, some issues that I think are central to this uh, uh, topic. So, um, so first I want to talk about, um, give a brief overview over the history of translation process research. Um, and, uh, I think a lot of protocols first in the first couple of uh, decades or so, then we had key logging, eye tracking, and now we have a, a large database or translation process data. And we do something that I like to call translation data analytics. There was one uh, topic that right from the beginning, an observation that there's automatized processes and uh, less automatized or controlled processes. That was right uh, from the beginning of translation process research an observation. I will talk about this and also how we try to integrate these two aspects of translation into monitor model. Then I will expand on this idea of the translation of the monitor model and integrate this into global workspace theory. Another topic that uh, comes up recently is the question of representationalism. And to what extent uh, we have a, here a, a, a computational theory of mind and so on. I want to talk about this, give examples from bilingualism and from artificial neural networks. Um, and then I want to, to still talk about uh, relevance theory um, and give an aspect of, um, of uh, representation and, re uh, and representationalism from uh, relevance theory. And I want to, to end with uh, some examples from our database to illustrate um, what we can make out of all this. So the translation uh, 
process research started around 40 years ago with the idea to look into to figure out what happens in the head of translators. So how do translators produce translation? They had to, it is a technologically very heavy uh, method, translation process research. First, they had these uh, think aloud protocols that means translators would sit and report uh, what they were thinking while translating and so on. These were recorded uh, sessions. They would be transcribed and then analyzed by the researcher, a very labor intensive method. And they, um, those researchers figured out strategies and some interesting insights into the translation process. Then, 10 years later, around 95, um, Dr. Jakobsen came up with this uh, Translog program that would, instead of asking translators what they think they would be doing, they would log keystrokes in time. So every keystroke would be associated with a timestamp, and then one could analyze the sequence uh, of uh, keystrokes and how translations evolve in time. 10 years later, uh, eye tracking technology was added to this. Uh, Translog program. So that would allow us to see where on the screen translators look, how they read the source text of the translations, and uh, how they type translations. So that would, so to say, give us an input to that black box and an output, and that would open the possibility to model what happens inside the mind. So in 2000, there was a sort of project I2IT that started in Copenhagen Business School around 2005, I believe. And um, in that context, a number of uh, studies were done and data was collected. And I joined at that time around uh, the Copenhagen Business School. And my idea was to gather all this data into a database, to bring it into a consistent format and to extract features and so on. So uh, then we have, uh, then develop the grid translation process research database. And by now we have uh, many, uh, many sessions, many studies, many hours of this data and this database, several thousand sessions um, and uh, a large amount of features and so on. And um, we have uh, an interface, uh, a browser interface that can connect to uh, Jupyter and, and Python, uh, some kind of programming tools and so on. And we use uh, uh, data analytics uh, methods to look into this data. So machine learning, a kind of visualization as, as uh, used in, in, in data science and so on with Python and all the libraries that are there. So I, I like to call this uh, translation data analytics actually. Um, right now based on this big data that we have. So this is a brief overview of what happened in translation process research from my point of view. And um, so right from the beginning, there was this observation that we have automated uh, procedures, translators would uh, uh, produce translation somehow in an automated way. And uh, control in Russia in 91 says there are two kinds of translation automatic, non strategic translation, and controlled strategic translation, which involve problem solving. So, two kinds of translation. Um, and uh, England Dimitrova, then a couple of years later, 15 years later, says something very similar. There are two, there are segments which are translated apparently automatically without any problems. So, automatic. Automatic translation uh, relates to no problems, whereas we have uh, the segments where translators are slow, full of many variations and deliberations, which necessitates problem-solving approaches and the application of strategies. So you, you see that the automat automatisms are related to quick production to less variation, whereas, uh, whereas deliberation and uh, relate to larger amount of of uh, variation in the translation product. So translators choose what to, what to do maybe, and we see different kinds of results. And also um, it's, it's slower. So a very similar thing then from Tirkan Kondit, who talks about procedure, um, procedural, uh, two kinds of procedures. The literal translation um, is a default rendering procedure which goes on until it is interrupted by a monitor. So she talks about two kinds of processes. 
which apparently take place in the translator's mind. One process, which she calls uh, literal translation, render, default rendering procedure and the monitor that looks at how, uh, um, how these output of the automated processes are rendered and interferes in the automated output when there is an error that occurs. So we did, we, uh, Moritz Schäfer and I, um, so actually based on a PhD of Moritz Schäfer, uh, put this into a, something we call the, the monitor model, uh, where the idea was to investigate uh, these automated processes. And the idea was, or the innovation I think was here that these automated processes are based on priming mechanisms. So priming takes place when uh, the, uh, the both languages share similar features, phonetic, syntactic, semantic features, which facilitates uh, translation, which primes the translator and triggers off these automatic processes. And uh, they would then um, be controlled by monitoring processes. And the model that we developed looks like this. So we have these two processes here, um, an automatic process here, which, uh, is called here horizontal processes. So it's horizontal because it's a direct connection from the source to the target. And there are shared nodes here, um, morpho or syntactic labels, which are shared between the source and the target. So uh, the source uh, uh, segment uh, is associated with some morphosyntactic features here, which are shared across the two languages and which facilitates the production into German in this case. Okay, so this is a kind of a priming process, very quick. And um, the monitoring process is what is indicated here by the two vertical bars, by the bridge <laughs> on top, where we have these uh, typical um, uh, linguistic strata, orthography, phon phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics, and so on, and on top, we have this independent for the two sides, right? So the, the idea would be that here the source uh, string is uh, analyzed uh, in the stratificational method and it uh, produces in the end some kind of a propositional form, which means which, which can check the truth uh, uh, of, uh, of this representation that is constructed and compare the two propositions on the source and the target and check whether they are identical. And if not, <laughs> then this monitor would interfere and then the translator would somehow modify the evolving target text to, uh, to account for those kinds of gaps in, uh, in this conversion. So this is uh, basically the idea of the monitor model. And the um, uh, it is based on a kind of a mo um, modularity theory. <laughs> okay, so it's a kind of a modularity um, a theory. So when we have um, the, the, the models, the horizontal processes are mo uh, modular processes, domain specific, and they are informationally encapsulated, right? So there is, uh, there, there is not much interference with other modules and other re knowledge resources in the modular processes. And then this vertical, process, this monitoring process is a non-modular process that can uh, look into a number of different resources and integrate resources from uh, different kinds of, uh, 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 yeah, uh, from different data, mental databases and integrate these things. So this looks very much similar to a global workspace theory, which is also a theory that uh, goes back to the 80s. And here, the idea is very similar that we have some kind of um, domain specific modules, which uh, have sensory input and effectors. Okay, so which, which uh, also are, uh, are uh, inca informationally encapsulated. They work uh, more or less independently with not many resources. Um, and they, uh, <coughs> And, uh, so, so we have different kinds of modules of this type, um, and they can send the signal to something called the global workspace, the, the global workspace, where those different signals are integrated, and then also um, fed back into these domain-specific modules here. 
Okay, so setting some prior probabilities, which would then bias the outcome of these domain specific modules. And you can see that we have here some kind of uh, uh, overlaying or superposition of different waves, which will then be reduced or uh, resolved in the global workspace um, uh, area. I will come back to this a little bit later. So another picture of the same model is this one here, where we have a hierarchy of uh, modules, four or six, something like this uh, here. And in the middle, we have this global workspace. And whatever is in the periphery here, this module in red here, for instance, doesn't even make it until the global workspace. So it's encapsulated, it works autonomous in a way, whereas those kind of, those two modules here have uh, links to the global workspace, right? And, um, and can become conscious. That's, uh, I think, one of those ideas I will talk about later the, about this. And this means that, so, so these modules uh, work to a certain extent autonomous, but they can also be synchronized and integrated in this global workspace here. So I will uh, now go on and talk about what it might mean um, or what the word representation might mean in this context. So what kind of representations we could have here or what kind of representation in this global workspace? And there are a number of different, there are very many different definitions of what a representation is. And here are three definitions. One is from Bermudez, 2014, inspired by uh, uh, computational theory of mind, which says that cognition is the computation of our representations. And he says that representations are distinct and identifiable components in a cognitive system. Okay, so distinct and identifiable components. And the idea is that we have representations and we have rules, and the rules work on these representations to produce some kind of meaning uh, and to uh, guide action, for instance, of a translator who then can produce the translation. So this is one definition. Another definition quite different is from Hutto and Mayen, who request that, trans uh, that representations have somehow associated a sense of correctness. And uh, so correctness, uh, representation specify correctness conditions. And um, so which makes them uh, logically dif different from mere correlation. Yeah, so we have correlations and we have, in this view, we have correlations and we have representations and representation is something more than just a correlation. It also gives the <laughs> those who have a representation of something a sense of whether something is correct or not. So this is a second definition. And the third definition here in computer science where are, are taken or often used in computer science where representations are just abstract groups that can be processed in terms of linear transformations over vector spaces. So it means you have some numbers, you do multiplication, addition, or whatever mathematical operations you have. And these numbers are then representations. And the question is not asked what they actually represent. <laughs> That's taken for granted. OK, so now if we look into these two kinds of uh, modules, the the, uh, the, the uh, encapsulated domain-specific models, models, and the in, uh, or the horizontal and the vertical processes. Here um, is an experiment from psycholinguistics, and I think there's a general agreement uh, that a model something like this would happen in the mind of humans. So here, the, uh, the idea is that somebody should should um, uh, uh, say what uh, pronounce uh, the, the, the item that they, there's a picture and they should say what it is. And then um, this would trigger off a number of different kinds of conceptual cues here. These would then uh, trigger off uh, some kinds of uh, lemmas, which can be here chair or table or to a smaller extent also bread or any other kind or all kinds of words. And in all languages, right? So here, this is Spanish here, this is English, 
And whatever the language you know, you see this picture, all, all uh, lemmas of all the languages that you know would be uh, 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 activated at the same time, so non-selectively. And then we have these um, kinds of, uh, of item that tells you, okay, you should pronounce this in English, and then eventually um, the word chair is uh, produced, right? So there is a large number of different items that are activated at the same time, basically, uh, or potentially all kinds of items. And something similar happens, of course, also in, in translation, where there's, there are several models. This is a picture from the Bayer model, but I think basically they uh, all assume something a little bit similar, where we, where we have here an input word in the source language that activates um, lexical, and you have lexical orthographic activations, phonological activation, then lexical activation, then you have the semantic activation with all the synonyms that we have, table and chair, uh, uh, table and chair and bread, whatever. <laughs> and these then um, activate again, the, uh, the phonological levels and so on. So you can imagine that this is actually an activation of a huge number of nodes of possibilities. And then uh, in the second step, we have a word. Uh, uh, so this is the word identification system. Then we have a task decision system that selects from all these activated possibilities the, that possibility that is most suitable in that particular moment. For instance, if you want to uh, say chair, then it would pick that chair, right? Okay, so I think one can understand this as a superposition of activations. So a superposition, you have a wave form, okay? And the superposition would then be just the sum of all these waves. And here we have a superposition of the blue and the green wave, which together gives the red wave. And so the uh, idea would be that uh, in this uh, decision system, the, uh, the system would then figure out which is, uh, which is maybe the right, um, the, 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 the wave that you, or the item that you want to choose from. So you, there are different kinds of way um, uh, operations that one can do with those uh, superposed activations. You can add waves. Uh, for instance, here, the signal becomes bigger because they reinforce, these two waves reinforce each other. It becomes bigger, the signal. Or they can be destructive. Here, it's exactly opposite. If you add up these two waves, they come out to be, uh, to, to, well, to negate themselves, right? Here, something similar happens in neural networks, actually. So as maybe some of you know, that uh, in neural networks and in, in uh, neural machine translation, we have these input vectors and we have an output vector and we can encode a whole dictionary in this uh, input vector here. So this XV would, for instance, uh, for instance have 50,000, uh, would, would be a vector of length 50,000 and each, um, position would encode one word, okay? So it would be a local one hot encoding. And um, so, so for instance, assume this would be a dog, right? So this one at this position encodes the word dog. And this is then mapped into a, dis into a distributed representation which is much shorter, this vector, but uh, which is, has distributed information. So basically, and this distributed uh, uh, representation is produced by this uh, embedding matrix. And the embedding matrix is, I think, one of the crucial tricks in, uh, in your machine translation. And so this is trained on huge corpora of text. So 6 billion words, maybe more in the meantime. And um, so it, it works, uh, so, uh, so it, it would, for instance, in this 6 billion word corpus, you would have 50 million occurrences of dog, as you, maybe, maybe 5 million. And then this uh, 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 distributed representation would encode all contexts in which this dog occurs in the 5 million different, I mean, potentially you have 5 million different contexts of the word, and it would encode 
all the different contexts for this word and superpose all the uh, uh, yeah the contextual um, con configurations of dog in this hidden uh, unit in this hidden uh, vector here. So uh, this hidden vector then is further uh, fed through different layers and so on, and maybe in the end mapped onto another output vector where this one then represents the French equivalent of dog, for instance, if you wanted to translate from English to French. And uh, so we would know that this guy here, this one here is an encoding for dog, this is an encoding for uh, the French equivalent, chien, for, for instance, and we would have a translation system there, can be more complex, yeah? Okay, so now it's clear that we have a representation here on the input and on the uh, output, but what kind of representation do we have here in the middle? What, <laughs> what kind of representation is this? If you look back to um, to the uh, so it's kind of a holistic okay so there is no feature that says inside this vector that says a dog has a cold nose has four legs or something like this it, it is only defined by the distance to other features okay so it's a kind of a holistic view on this which is not analytical in any way where we say what is a dog and what consists but only a dog is on uh, this representation of dog is with respect to the differences to all other items in that language. It's kind of holistic representation. Now, if you look back to the original definitions of representation here, where Bermuda says a representation is uh, distinct and identifiable components in a cognitive system. Is this hidden vector, is this an identifiable component in a cognitive system? I would say no, it's not. It cannot, it's not identifiable in the sense that it's analytical. Um, it, and also, uh, and he says there, uh, we need to be able to distinguish between representations and rules that operate on these representations. But what happens in this neural networks is not kind of rules. It's a kind of a multiplication and an addition, a superposition of different waves, which is different from a rule, I would argue. So is it, um, is it, uh, the, uh, does it correspond to this second um, definition of representation? A representation can specify correctness conditions, truth, reference implications that make it logically different from um, covariance or correlation. And I would say, no, we don't know actually, right? It may be that inside this vector somehow is, uh, encoded also in what context this is really a dog or something else. Maybe, maybe not. We don't, we cannot decide. But what certainly is true is this last definition where representations are abstract groups of uh, numbers or vectors, and we can uh, apply all kinds of mappings and uh, transform this into another vector space and so on. And in that sense, it is a representation. I would like to now show a similar example from our research, uh, uh, translation research, where we have uh, these kinds of um, observations. So we have uh, a sentence, in the, uh, an English sentence. He was given four life sentences, translated by 22 translators um, into Spanish. And then we can align each of those words, each of the English words uh, with the uh, 22 different translations. And then we can count how often a, a particular English word is translated into what Spanish word, right? So for instance, here four, all 22 translators agreed that cuatro would be the correct translation. All, tra all 22 translators means there's a probability of one, right? Everybody agrees. It's a probability of one that the translation of four is cuatro. But there is, a, well, as you can see, a very different distribution for each of the words. Given here, uh, translators are uh, they have very many different, make different decisions. Four of them choose the Iran and so on. So there is a, 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 a selection of a large number of possibilities for uh, how uh, translators render this. And so you can go through those different 
um, awards here, and we can compute from this distribution uh, probability, and from this probability we can pro produce an entropy value and a perplexity value means that if uh, this value is high here, like 11.5. Seven means there is a flat distribution. There's many choices, and uh, translators can choose or choose from a different, uh, from a large number of different uh, possibilities. Whereas here, they uh, all agree on this. And this number, it's interestingly, correlates with the duration, how long it took for the translators to produce that translation. Means that if the number is high. Remember that the distribution is very flat. There's a large uh, number of options, and it takes longer for a translator to produce that word than if there is like quattro for translation. There's only one option, right? Um, so, what does this mean? How can this be explained? It, <coughs> my or our suggestion would be that uh, a translator needs to make a decision here. So, every all of these words somehow. I mean, what we can see in the output. Each translator produces one translation. Okay, we can only see one translation for each translator, but we can see differences. And uh, so, uh, potentially, it means that all these uh, possibilities somehow occurred to every translator, and they need to decide how to render the text. And this decision takes time. It takes time to decide which of those. Uh, uh, solutions a translator should go for. It doesn't take time for this quattro because boom, it's there. It's obvious. If there is a large number of decisions, it takes time. And so basically, there is, if you talk about, if you think of this um, superposition of different possibilities, there is a superposition of all these possibilities, probably many more than those ones. Uh, hidden in the in the translator's mind, and this uh, superposition needs to be uh, disambiguated or collapsed into one solution that takes time. Okay, now, so how does this relate to the second component, to this uh, vertical monitoring processes? And I would like to uh, talk here about uh, about relevance theory. <laughs> relevance theory is a theory. Also from the 80s, uh, it's a communication theory of explaining communication. Uh, we have a speaker and the hearer, and the hearer uh, tries to understand a message following a path of uh, a relevance guided comprehension procedures, following a path of least of maximum relevance and least effort. So uh, a, trans, uh, a hearer of a message. Um, tries to extract a maximum number of effects. So if I say, uh, tell you something, I say something, you try to understand this, you, you test, uh, you, you generate maybe hypothesis, what this could mean, you try to refer to something that you know, and you try to make sense of what I'm trying to say. And um, so this is a kind of an effort, and, uh, and, um, and you try to minimize this effort to get a maximum number, maximum amount of um, effect. So you want to learn <laughs> a maximum thing, I get more sort of uh, what I'm saying, for instance. Uh, so, and, but once you are happy with the message, you will stop and you don't, don't do any more inferences or more, more hypothesis, what I could have meant or so. And you're happy with, uh, with the interpretation of that message and you go on. So there are two things, um, greater processing effort. So you produce more hypothesis and so on, leads to lower relevance. So something is relevant in this view if the effort is small and the effect is high, right? And uh, this can be then represented in such kind of a graph here, or uh, a field of relevance where we have effort that can be acceptable or excess effort, and the effect can be worth, worthy or unworthy. Right, and we want to add up, of course, in this upper uh, uh, area here, where we uh, where a hearer in that case spends an acceptable amount of effort to get a maximum or a worthwhile effect. Okay, so good. Um, apply this model to translation, and he uh, said that okay, so we have a translation is basically a communicative situation 
and the translator pro, uh, is in the middle and produces this interpretive uh, resemblance of the text, but he was looking into uh, the, for the, the translator should try to optimize the relevance for uh, listeners. So um, he's, he says Alves, who uh, very much used uh, this relevance theory in uh, translation process research, he says mental representations of speakers are interpretively used by learners, but of course a mental representation is something private in the author's mind and cannot directly be used interpretively what he so this uh, may be uh, so an, an, an author would write a text okay and this text would be then hopefully faithfully translated into the target language and the translator would translate this text in such a way that um, the author can uh, go along with this optimization of relevance principle of understanding with the maximum effort, maximum effect, um, effect least effort, right? Okay, so what I would argue is that each of these communication participants has their own field of relevance. So uh, uh, an author, of course, uh, would have uh, an effort is to formulate the, the message, and the effect would be the message, the text itself. And the translator has an effort in producing the translation. And there we have a temporal, uh, technical, uh, a temporal, technical, and cognitive effort that the translator can spend to produce a text. And the effect would be the faithful production of the translation according to a translation brief. Yeah, as you know, translator often has a brief or an idea for whom they translate, and so they would. Um, trying to produce a translation according to that brief. And the recipient in, in general uh, then in turn has their own set of uh, uh, relevance criteria that they generate and uh, evaluate these hypotheses. And uh, the, that would be the effort yeah, generating these hypotheses, evaluating them, and the effect would be changes in their cognitive environment. So if you, if the recipient learns something, then it would be a change in their cognitive environment. So we can uh, uh, show this, represent this for a translator in, in such a graph, maybe, where we can say, uh, well, it's a question of how we now operationalize effort and effect. But uh, we can maybe say that uh, the duration is an indicator of the eff effort, okay? As if a translator needs longer, the effort would be higher and the effect would be the quality of the translation according to that translation brief. And so we can have this kind of field of relevance which uh, applies to a translator and, um, and where, we can, where we can put, we can chop off the text into smaller pieces and uh, see what uh, where, where in that field uh, of relevance a translator behaves. So before I do this, uh, I still want to look into meta representation and higher order representations because that's what the model uh, already uh, assumed. Yes, yeah? so the uh, the monitor model, and here. Um, that uh, somehow overlaps with uh, different stages in the development of this relevance hypo uh, theory. So originally uh, the relevance theory was uh, uh, stated that uh, a translation should be, uh, 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 translation is good if the propositional forms are identical in the source and the target language. Um, and this means the truth context, uh, the truth uh, relations in the source and the target language. But good came then up with this idea that uh, translation is some is interpretive use of language. It's not descriptive use. So a translator would not describe what the author says, but they would try to make sure that the interpretation of the, the source uh, or the interpretation that the source audience has is somehow reflected in the interpretation that the target audience has. So it's an interpretive use, not a descriptive use. And this would be um, achieved by looking at implicature, so what is implied in the text, and also what is explicit in the text. So what is coded in the text itself, and what is uh, implied by the text, and so on. So this was 
the uh, original motivation of using this relevance theory for uh, translation. But then in 2004, he came up with a few extensions of this model. And one of those is meta representational use. And he said, in order to do this kind of a translation and uh, interlingual interpretive use, a translator would need to have an understanding of the cognitive environment of the uh, author and, the, and uh, the recipient and so on. And then um, and later, or he, uh, there's a higher order act of communication where he makes a distinction between the stimulus mode and the, inter the I mode, interpretive mode. And in my reading of this, it looks quite similar to, um, to the monitor model where we have the two modes, the horizontal mode, where uh, we have S, the S mode is somehow the stimulus very uh, stick, stick to, the, uh, to the surface. And uh, the interpretive mode would be maybe correspond to something like a monitor mode. But I would like to now <laughs> go on a little bit with this meta representational use and talk uh, and look what this could possibly mean and how we can make sense of, uh, of this. So what Good himself shows are those kinds of figures. He says, so the poor translator here, okay, this guy here, he needs to meta represent the author with all his cognitive environment and the receptor with all his cognitive environment. So there's, uh, yeah, and um, uh, there's not much explanation what this actually means. Yeah, so, so there's a nice picture, but we cannot make, I mean, if we really ask what this actually means, we don't come much further. And um, so, so Alves, for instance, says meta representations are representations of representations. Okay, so what? <laughs> Um, a little bit further, one might come by looking back into Sperber and Wilson, who actually developed this relevance theory, and they make a distinction between three levels of meta representation. The first level is a naively optimistic interpreter who uh, accepts the first interpretation that comes to their mind. So basically, they don't have a meta representation, they just accept the first interpretation. Then we have the cautious optimist who's capable of dealing with mismatches, first order false beliefs, so lies and deliberate deception. So, so if there is a, uh, is a slip of the tongue, if I say something, which may easily happen, and, uh, but I use the wrong word, but you know what I'm trying to say, you would nevertheless understand the meaning because you're a cautious, at least optimistic um, understander, right? And then they have this third level where we have a sophisticated understander and the sophisticated understander can also recognize if somebody lies, if I say something that is not true. And then the sophisticated understander would understand, oh, this person is lying. Okay, not only if there's a slip of the tongue or something um, uh, uh, yeah, where, I, where you assume that I have good intention, but something saying wrongly, so you still understand, the sophisticated understander, in addition, understands what lies are. So if we apply this to a translator, what kind of uh, meta representation would a translator need in their work? Okay, <laughs> I, I assume in any case, a translator would not correct lies, right? Otherwise, Trump speeches would never be <laughs> correctly translated. Okay, so uh, this, uh, I mean, a translator can be a sophisticated understander, but not in their work. I, I guess they would be fired immediately. <laughs> Is a translator a cautious optimist? So if a politician says Iran and says uh, and means Iraq or Ukraine and, or something like this, and, the, and it's clear from the context this was a slip of the tongue or something. Would a translator correct this? This is a real question to you, your experienced translators. You not? Yes, they would. No, perhaps not. No? Depends. Depends. Yes. I, 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 I would think it's quite risky, right? So, so they need to have really good trust relation, the, the translator and and the text. No? So, so, um, but the translator would be on the, on the sure side 
if they would not correct uh, slips of the tongue. So means basically the translator in general does not have meta representation. At least they don't make use of those meta representations in their work. Okay, so this classification doesn't help any further either, not to come closer to what meta representation means in a translation job. So then there is a large number of different theories about higher order theory, and they make a distinction between first order representations, which are these uh, representations in the domain specific models that we talked about earlier. Uh, perceptual states about external uh, uh, objects. Um, and um, so these kinds of first order representations are not sufficient for consciousness. Uh, so you are not conscious about uh, what happens in these uh, domain specific models. And, uh, but you can produce meaningful behavior non-consciously. Yeah? So, so you can do meaningful interaction with the world non-consciously. Then you have these um, second or higher order representations, which is some kind of inner awareness of what is going on inside you. And uh, so that can be maybe distinguished from meta representation. So you have a, re you have a representation in this theory, you have a, re a representation of this first order representation, and which would then uh, mean you have a different instance of what happens in this uh, in these domain specific modules, so the so that would be represented as a second uh, order uh, representation. That's why it's called the second order representation. There's a uh, lots of different theories and how exactly that could be and what are the arguments pro and con and so on. But this is different from the global network theory, which uh, some people call a first order view. So where the idea is. You remember these lines in the in one of those pictures that I showed in the beginning, where you have links between these different modules and so on. These would just be uh, uh, connections between the, with the different modules, and they integrate the output of the domain specific modules, but they do not create re new representations for themselves. And these, uh, these kinds of uh, lines, these connections between these different modules would then be uh, integrated, they would uh, and fit and, and broadcast, as they say here, uh, back into, uh, into these domain specific modules. And the idea is that as soon as something, so, so there's a certain threshold and, uh, when uh, these domain specific modules uh, activate these this global workspace. And once there's an activation in this workspace, then it is conscious. And so that's a kind of a definition of conscious. When does something become conscious? According to this global network theory, it's conscious when it's inside this global uh, workspace and uh, integrate the output of the various modules. Okay, so this is different still <laughs> from a notion of conscious experience and metacognition and metacognition um, um, implies a kind of rating so if according to these kind of sets of theories there is metacognition um, so if you have a metacognitive uh, awareness or something about um, an item then uh, then it's a rating of confident how confident are you uh, of something and if you can say i'm this is confident then we have a meta uh, uh, conscious uh, or metacognition, metacognitive state. Okay, and this brings us back to this first or this third definition of representation that Hutto and Mayen had about a representation. What is a representation? For them, apparently, this is representation, and only this is a representation if somebody has a, an, a sense of whether something is correct or not, and whether something uh, uh, yeah so 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 if you can rate uh, something as confident and so on okay so so there is much i mean this was very brief overview of what i understood by browsing through this literature a little bit i guess there's much more but it seems to me that there are two things in conscious representation one is in consciousness there can be only one item Okay, so you're conscious of one thing. You are not conscious 
of something that is 20% a chair and 10% a table that could be a bread or your grandma or, uh, or, some, or for that matter, anything to some extent. We are not aware of something like this, right? So, so the, these kinds of representations that we had, uh, where we have this hidden in the hidden layer, where uh, all items in the language are are activated to a certain extent, we don't have this in our conscious mind, right? So, the consciousness is one thing is activated at a time, and so the function of consciousness in that uh, regard is to disambiguate the superpositions. Right? So if something is conscious in the mind, we have one solution and the function is this disambiguation. So as a consequence, uh, the, uh, the, this would suggest that if the domain specific mod modules cannot resolve a superposition of different kinds of uh, activations, it becomes conscious and this conscious kind of experience <laughs> make sure that there is a kind of a uh, solution or kind of a decision uh, which, which thing it is, right? Okay, so now I have 10 minutes left for empirical investigations to look into how we can uh, relate our data uh, to these kind of things. And uh, so there is one um, study, there is very nice studies uh, in my, uh, uh, that I'm aware of. One study is here from Alves and Gonchalves in 2013, where they make a distinction between four levels of uh, more or less uh, metacognitive activity, and they call these P0 to P3. Um, they look at translation units. I will talk in a moment what a translation unit is. It comes, well, it's a, it's a sequence of looking into reading a piece of reading a piece of text and then translating it. So this is a translation unit. And they make a, a distinction between four kinds of translation units here, P0, no revision takes place. Okay, this is 48% of what they observe in their data. Then they have immediate revision, which they call uh, P1, um, and some level of metacognition, and then proper revisions, which take place later during um, uh, the translation job. So when they come back and revise something and so on. So they call this. Uh, P2 and uh, P3. And then they figure out that 52% of all the corrections is typos, and only 22% uh, concerns lexical and syntactic uh, phrases and so operations. So that means if you multiply these, so we can actually say that only those lexical and syntactic operations in somehow, some way uh, represent meta cognitive activity, right? So typos is not really related to meta. Uh, meta representations and so on. If so, if you multiply those numbers, it tells us that 3.5% of the translation units show higher degrees of metacognitive activity, which uh, seems very low, but it has also to do with the way I think they address this, and there's much space, I want to argue now, <laughs> to look into this and uh, do better. So here is a kind of a representation of how a translation emerges. Um, we see the source text on the vertical left, which is uh, hospital. So not all words are shown on the vertical axis. And then we see on the horizontal axis, the timeline in which the translation emerges in time. So we can uh, see uh, in blue, the blue dots are fixations on the source text and the green uh, dots are fixations on the target text on the emerging uh, uh, translation and then we have in black below here these are the keystrokes and red here for instance there's a red keystroke or here uh, which are deletions so this sequence of uh, or this uh, translation sessions can be chopped up in smaller chunks which uh, are translation units and here are um, okay so this can be chopped up in translation units and um, here are marked on the top uh, the typing bursts, so it means the sequences of keystrokes in which the translation was produced. And before this, here we see uh, there's a pause, a typing pause, and then we see here on this line um, how the eyes go from the source to the target, how the eyes go back and forth between the source and the target. So we see here in these two lines here, we see a coordination between hands, fingers, 
and gaze data. So where do the gaze looks on the source and the target side? And where do, um, what does the translator type in? And here we can see how more precisely what exactly was produced. Here is a zoom in, a zoom into a more detailed uh, translation unit, uh, basically two. And this whole thing is the translation of um, in the increasing exposure of, so in, in the increasing exposure of, right? So you can see here that first the translator looks at the source text, takes in new so, uh, source, uh, a new chunk, and then types out the translation here. In red, there's a deletion. So this is an immediate correction, immediate trans, uh, correction of the translation. And so this is uh, of type one, uh, P1, a, a translation unit of type one. Then towards the end, while typing here still, the translator looks again to the source text and then uh, verifies the target text here with the green dots and uh, keeps on uh, typing in the rest of this uh, phrase by monitoring, by looking at how the keystrokes uh, uh, pop up uh, in the target screen. And then goes on to towards the end again, read in the next chunk of text. So you can see that there is a reading of the source, typing, monitoring what happens, reading, typing, and so on. And so this is a sequence of uh, translation units. The first one is of type one, and the second one is of type zero. And uh, according to uh, Alves and Gonçalves, this would be automatic, uh, automated processes. We can see that here, not much time is there actually to uh, analyze the whole sentence or to, to do some kind of, to generate some kind of meta representation. So this looks like, like quite automatized procedures, right? I hope you agree. Here is another um, uh, similar or very different <laughs> translation unit. It, it is similar in that respect, uh, the, the guy I suppose, back and forth between the source and the target text. But the chunk of writing here is much longer. It's actually um, 40 seconds, right? So th this is a time span 40, uh, 37 uh, seconds to uh, 73 seconds. So, so maybe it's around 40 seconds. And 40 seconds, this translator produces this whole segment here without a longer stop than one second. So it's a very fluent translation by scanning in, by reading in a little bit ahead of what happens in the source and then immediately typing out um, the translation. This actually is like a phrase-based machine translation, you can say, without reordering, right? <laughs> Where this guy looks uh, only a few words ahead and types out the translation. Of course, there's more model going on, but um, but I would uh, also argue that this is, uh, looks like an automated uh, procedure there, you know, where where very much I mean there's no space, no time here to imagine that this translator could have generated somehow a meta representation or uh, an analysis of the whole sentence and verified the truth conditions maybe of the sentence and so on. So all this did not happen. So it looks very much to me like an automatic automatism uh, of the translator. So we can also, we have, uh, okay, we can look quite endlessly into those uh, translation units and it, I do this all the time and it's very interesting. Here is an example uh, for a listing. So here the translator first reads the sentence, right? To, I would say, to prime the, uh, the domain specific module, right? And then we have here a sequence of automatized uh, translation units where, um, uh, where the translations are produced. Here we have a, a kind of a local search. This translator reads a little bit ahead, reads again, then types in the translation again, reads a little bit ahead. And so it's a kind of local search uh, uh, for the translator. Here we have an extended search. Here the translator produces quite fluently some stuff. And then apparently uh, there is a kind of a problem in the middle of that sentence where the translator reads and reads again and so on until maybe uh, uh, a solution, uh, he found a solution and then goes or he or she and goes on with translating here. So, okay, so we can look, we can quantify these translation units in different ways. So we have uh, a number of measures that we can devise uh, 
uh, effect. So we, we are no. So so if we look into um, that notion of relevance, we can break down the notion of relevance into these translation units, right? And we can uh, quantify the effect and the effort per uh, translation units. So the effect would be the text produced, yeah. So the string. So what did the translator produce? The number of insertions, deletions, the words, the number of words that were produced, the part of speech. So maybe a verb a producing the translation of a verb would be more um, uh, effectful than a translation of noun, maybe, or something. Um, so we can look into uh, probability. So uh, also, also frequency, uh, producing an unfrequent word may have a higher effect a more precious effect than a low frequency word. Same we can do with the effort. We can look into the duration, which is, uh, of course, uh, or maybe one of the, the dominant uh, aspects of effort, duration of the tran whole translation unit of the production unit, the number of times the translator switches between source and target window, the number of uh, the number of uh, fixations on the source and the uh, target window, the number of regressions, and all this we can compute per translation unit a large number of those kinds of indicators of effect and effort. And then we can relate this to relevance and to those uh, other kinds of. Uh, of parameters that I uh, tried to discuss. So we have automatism, automatized uh, translation units, and then we have non-automatic translation units. Um, so some maybe relate to gisting, so getting an idea of what this is the text about, to bias, yeah, to uh, remember there was in one of those pictures uh, a bias, uh, uh, a prior, a, a prior probability to set prior probabilities for for the text to come. So we have gisting, or we have searching, and searching would then uh, relate maybe more to a particular to precise a concrete problem in the translation process. We have local and extended uh, uh, searching, and then we have revision, where a translator reads again the translation, or a revisor reads again the translation and checks consistency, for instance. All this we could look into uh, under this, uh, under this uh, uh, aspect of relevance, how relevant this is. We can see the relation between effort and effect there. OK, and this is uh, the end of my presentation. So what I try to talk about is the monitor model and, and uh, try to argue that this is a special case of the global net neural workspace theory. I talked about automatisms and, um, and uh, non-automatic procedures about um, the notion of uh, representation and non-representationalism. And, um, and I was trying to convince you that there is a kind of a superposition that uh, is triggered off in a, trans, uh, in a translator's mind, or for that matter, in anyone's mind. And this can be resolved uh, through uh, domain-specific modules, or if not, then certainly through conscious uh, representation, there's only one item, and consciousness will resolve ambiguities and superpositions. And uh, well, consciousness of, obviously also serves other purposes, like better memorization, planning, and so on. But um, um, yeah, so and to my uh, idea here, <laughs> or would be then uh, we can, uh, based on this, devise many research experiments where we can uh, look into what exactly does meta representation mean and how we can classify those kinds of different meta representation, how we can uh, analyze or detect traces of this in the data and relate this to these kinds of relevance, uh, field of relevance that I try to uh, establish here. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much um, for an inspiring talk, full of uh, full of interesting, I think, stimuli for all of us to think about. So, 
Um, we have, I think we have questions. Well, I'm not sure whether we have questions here right now. And I also don't know whether we have questions online, but um, some of us have been logging in online. So I'll um, hand this over to Joanna and Felix, who have been in the background trying to keep all the questions together. So um, how are we doing this? Yes, I think we need to do some switching. Okay. Yes, we need to do some switching. So we are, we are, bear with us, we are getting to purchase this in the um, hybrid mode here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So uh, first, I think we'll uh, try and take some questions from the audience uh, Audience uh, here. So do you have any immediate questions from the audience? <laughs> yes, so uh, Anna, do you have a question? Yes. Yes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. Um, very, um, I learned many things. And I, I'd just like to ask something about, um, because in your model, it seems that all translators are the same. I'm sure you didn't have time to get into that. But how do you integrate um, here different levels of translation proficiency, different levels of familiarity uh, with a topic, different levels of language proficiency uh, and tiredness? And I know it's already a very sophisticated model, but these are all possible intervening variables. And how do you look at the data? Uh, yeah, so we have, uh, the, these are kind of partially kind of meta representation for the data. So we uh, often ask uh, translators with these experiments, what is their expertise? So uh, how many years of uh, translation experience, experience they have? And um, we can relate this, of course, to the data. So for instance, the one, uh, graph that I showed with this very long uh, fluent translation about uh, over 40 seconds, right? You can, you can only expect this from a very experienced translator to, to be produced. So, uh, Sorry, um, or a very naive translator. Um, because isn't there a sense? I mean, I see this in our students here, this kind of uh, U-shaped curve, uh, lots of confidence in the beginning, then this big dip in, oh, how much I don't know. Yeah. Then everything that was automatic becomes, you know, panic. And then it starts to become automatic again at a higher level. Yeah, okay. So um, maybe this needs to yes, be... Yeah, so yes, certainly that makes sense. But uh, well, the data that uh, I was showing there is uh, from an experiment on one of the earliest experiments that we had in 2008 uh, from Christian Weltlund. Uh, and he had very experienced translators there. And so there are a couple of... Uh, publications that uh, we had. So we, we saw that if translators are able to read the source text while producing the output, this is a very high level of expertise. <laughs> we wouldn't see this in, uh, and I, I'm, uh, it, well, I, I, I think it's hard to believe that uh, an unexperienced translator um, it would be able to do something like this. I mean, it already, uh, or maybe you can say it, it relates to typing uh, skills, right? And uh, translators are not uh, necessarily that a good typist is not necessarily good at translator or the other way around. But usually, good translators are good typists, I think. At least that's what I saw. <laughs> yeah. But of course, you are right. So uh, the, one can also look into the translation quality. How good is the translation? And a look into, and there is a large number of different methods that one can do uh, to errors or the overall uh, quality of the translation and so on. And we do this too, uh, to, we can relate this quality uh, feature with the data and have some kind of interaction effects there and so on. Yes. 
Same with, uh, so you mentioned also um, uh, whether the translator is tired or not. Uh, we did look into this very much, I admit, because our texts are quite short that we have with this tool, so 160 words, and we expect them usually to be able to do this in one rush, uh, 20 minutes, without too much exhausting the translators. And, and I take it they're not topic specific, they're sort of general language. Um, yeah, so the yes, the text that we, I mean, we can set up experiments, of course, uh, any uh, way we, we want to or do want to, and but the text that we have mostly worked in uh, with as uh, news texts, quite general, but uh, increasingly also more um, specialized texts. Yes. Thank you very much. We have a few questions online. One is from Jiajo. Yeah. So his question is what eye movement measures are indicative of automatic and control processing, respectively, during translation processes? What do you think? Yeah, well, I think that's an interesting question. But uh, uh, so, uh, so the, the original study from Alves and Gonsalves. So they didn't, I think they didn't have eye trackers. So they only looked at the pauses. They only did look at the revision behavior. And if there was a, a revision, um, then um, they would assume that it's a meta, um, some metacognitive processes interfere. And if we have this eye gaze data also, no, I would think um, that uh, if a translator does not read a large chunk of text, they can simply not have produced an analysis of the text of the sentence of the segment. So there's another question that relates uh, what you said with the idea of augmented translator. Uh, and this notion of predicting the effort uh, that you, you mentioned. Um, is it possible to uh, highlight translation units that will imply and predict more effort from the translator, do you think? That's, that's something that's possible? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, one needs to have a definition, what that means, and then one can highlight this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the other question is about, uh, after you found the correlation between production time and the number of translation alternatives, uh, did you make uh, the, your assumption about priming effect, or can you ensure that every participant know all of the alternatives? Uh, and in that case, would you conduct a retrospective interview in your study to understand how this? I don't think that retrospective interviews would be very helpful because those processes are automatized; they don't enter uh, conscious uh, the yeah, the conscious area. Um, so, inter, um, well, the translator could say, well, I had problems to find a good translation for this and that, but what kinds of solutions went through their minds, uh, I guess that would be quite, quite different. I mean, uh, all the different solutions. So, yeah, so these processes are quite quick, right? So this, this activation of all, uh, of, all the, uh, of all the networks and then the selection of um, of a solution that would be in the order of a few hundred milliseconds, maybe. Do you have any more questions from the audience? Thank you for very interesting talk. I have a very simple question in relation with the relevance theory that you were talking about earlier. And the sentence that was used as part of that study that you referred to, uh, he was given four life sentences. What was the kind of, why was that particular sentence chosen? Because for me, immediately I started thinking, it is such a random sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, background to it? Yes. <laughs> and also, were there any kind of other languages that it was compared to? Yeah. Because in this instance, you said it was in, in Spanish. Because I'm just assuming from my simple understanding that you know, different languages yeah. 
would give totally different results in this aspect. Okay, so the first question of uh, this text is uh, from a series of uh, texts that we have uh, used since uh, this initial study from uh, Christian Beltland. He did his PhD and he used three texts. And the first one is this uh, um, uh, killer nurse text, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is so often cited. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, just a sentence from this, um, from this text. Well, any sentence taken out of context is random for a certain, no, in a certain way. And uh, yes, we have, uh, we have many hundred translations for these texts into a large number of uh, languages, into uh, six or maybe in the meantime, eight different languages. And um, some of them, Chinese, for instance, there is hundred, more than hundred different translators translating the same text from English into Chinese. And then we can see uh, the variation that they produce uh, very clearly. Um, yes. So this was uh, uh, an answer to your second question, right? So uh, do we have different languages? Yes, we have different languages. Uh, the languages that we have for this particular text is um, Danish, that was the first, and then Spanish, German, um, Hindi, um, Japanese, and Chinese. So, which is nice because uh, Danish is very similar to English, Spanish also, <laughs> German a little bit more remote, right? I mean, because of word order and stuff. And then we have Hindi, which is further away even, and uh, Chinese also is an SEO language, I believe. But Japanese is very different. So we have, a, we have a, a, an interesting mix of very different languages. And we have lots of we have uh, done lots of investigation with those different languages. But interestingly, these kinds of uh, we call this word translation entropy. So, so if there's a big choice for one particular word, this seems tends to be the case across very different all the different languages to a certain extent. But um, uh, yeah, so so we have these different languages, and we can see similar effects across different languages. Okay. Do you have any more questions? Thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask something in relation to that sentence. And very different. I wonder what brief they were given, because I also think, I guess you know what I'm going to mean, to translate this so plainly and so literally is of course only one way of doing this. That would be, I mean, in, in, a, in, in languages with a legal system where right? you don't have to discuss it, you would have to come up with something about different one. Right? Um, so that may be a little bit constructed here, but we, we all know that. And, uh, in relation to that, I'd be wondering, you know, what you said about the Sperber and Wilson type of meta representation, sophisticated understanding of those. And I think as a translator, you have to be a sophisticated understander. For example, to deal with such sentences, to see whether there is really the right kind of context to translate that so literally, or whether you have to come up with something completely different, which you may mean you take out the four that all your translators agree to. Get, no? But for me, this, this idea of being a sophisticated understander where, yes, you recognize mismatches and indeed lies and all that. I was sort of one of the people who earlier said it depends. You know, for me, it doesn't imply that you then make a decision to change. For me, it only implies that you that you have that later ability to see what different ways there are of understanding something. And also, it doesn't imply to me that um, that it's uh, it doesn't imply to me you know, that you that you necessarily have to say, okay, one thing is true. Well, I have the confidence in this and the other thing, but isn't it more that as a translator, you may need this ability to see different possibilities and then make a decision, not necessarily on the basis of something is true or not, but on the basis of something that I might not even believe is true, but it fits in the context in which I'm translating. And this is more of a, of a comment, maybe not really a question. Yeah, so. Mm. <laughs> well, I, 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 um, so the first question, translation brief, yes, right? yes. 
And um, I think, uh, so we have different kinds of uh, transactions there. We have uh, from scratch transactions, and, and uh, I didn't conduct all the uh, experiments, so I don't know all about them. But uh, so the, I think the general idea was that translators should do uh, okay translation, but not to get uh, into small details and to spend too much time there. So that was for the from scratch translation and for uh, for post editing, we also have different versions of post editing with a statistical entry and now with an NMT and so on. And there was the idea to have light post editing, not to go too much into the details. Um, and uh, I think this is also usually understood by the translators so when they see this answer. And then, of course, I mean, we have a lag setting, right? So they, uh, um, it may be. That the translators don't care so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, they say, okay, let's do this 20 minutes and done, something like this. And maybe uh, this is quite a different situation where we have uh, right. well, We will figure this out eventually. <laughs> no, also, okay, if the, if the brief is straightforward, then, you know, say, um, you repeat the concept, you assume that that concept. Existent, then that's fine. I was just wondering what they told. Yeah, so uh, I think mostly they were told something. So, how to, to do this and not to do uh, very shiny texts. <laughs> and, um, and the other question about uh, this uh, meta representation, I think that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, hypothesis, and, uh, and I think it, it could be tested actually. So, what uh, we have seen in text that indicates that there are so blatant errors from translators, which, and we have uh, one text from a Japanese uh, person coming to, uh, no, from an Australian minister coming to Japan talking about bilateral translation and uh, cooperation, political on a high level. Politi and so um, they, uh, these translators have so blatant errors where the syntax was maybe a little bit complicated, which the only explanation that I have, they did not care about it. They, they did not have an idea um, about what this is all about and, and why this uh, Australian minister came to Japan. And these are professional, I mean, you can look into this, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Michael, we have uh, this online audience, and okay. uh, some of them are in China, and apparently it's get, getting very late there. Uh, Vivian asked the question. Uh, so you have mentioned the domain-specific module when you uh, talked about private activation, right? Uh, and she asks, does this mean that the, the model of effect and the effort, it, it, that it should be interpreted within the scope of the source text domain? So. Uh, Perhaps the implications might be for among different text types, uh, such as news film literature. Would these have different implications in terms of the effort and the effect? Yeah, so I, I guess this uh, domain specific module there uh, relates to translation skill in general, not to the domain in a specific technological area, if that was the understanding. So this domain specific module would not be uh, somebody is good in, I don't know, uh, car repairing or uh, financial translation, the other one. Uh, so, so it's not domain like this. It's domain uh, translation and um, and uh, social skills or whatever domain that is. Okay. Um, could you, um, Margaret Rogers asked, um, when you analyze the sentence, the sentence he was given four life sentences, you apparently are describing the sentence word by word, the effects word by word. How do you uh, move this from word by word to translation units? So the translation unit is a view on the process. So we look at the time, how the translation evolves in time, and we chop up the timeline according to the uh, uh, to the gaps in in production right 
So this is a translation unit. Now, if we look into uh, into the alignment, that is the question, right? Mm -hmm. So how does this relate to, to the alignment of different translations to one word? That's a different view. That's a view from the, from, from the textual data that, that doesn't look into the process, how the translation evolves, that looks into the variation that are produced for a specific translation. Later, of course, we can merge this together, but it's two different kinds of views. Well, in the meantime, Devin has published uh, in the chat the, the link for some of the studies that you are referring to. Okay. It's not Thank you, Devin. Yeah. So everyone who is online can use this, this, um, this link. Those of us who are here in the room, we don't see the link, but uh, you are giving all of this information to us in this next few days, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so no more questions online, if any one of us wants to ask a question. Questions in the audience here? I mean, we have a technical question since we talked about these uh, errors that you mentioned just now. Um, in your database, as, is there any um, qualitative assessment of the data if someone wanted to um, to you use your data and process research and of course studying the effects would be very much linked to the quality is there any tagging of data in the database to do with quality in the database it's yeah i mean we did uh, a number of quali qualitative analysis um mostly on an uh, mqm based uh, error taxonomy which looks at the fluency and accuracy errors, maybe with a few, few finer gradient uh, subcategories. We also have um, for some texts um, some kind of holistic analysis where uh, translators were asked to rate uh, the whole segments. Uh, on a textual level, we don't have this. So we have uh, this error analysis, means that uh, words, fine grained. Um, and for several texts, not for all, of course, because that's manual work. And, <clears throat> and then uh, we have this uh, second case. And uh, yes, there are some studies and also some publications that look into those kinds of things. Yes. Is it possible to filter uh, the data, uh, the, the data sets according to whether they've been quantitatively assessed? Or uh, so there's a lot of data sets in there. <laughs> Possible. I mean, this stuff, this uh, annotation is not uh, a very, uh, it's not in a very structured uh, kind of way. Uh, once, well, in, in principle, it would be possible to filter this, but first we would have to organize the data in that way. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions from the audience or from the online audience? Mm -hmm. Sorry, maybe I can ask this one. Um, but you have already, a, yeah. I think you have already approached this. Um, the question is how could you integrate the translator's degree or experience in your approach, which is related to the um, yeah. kind of yeah. Right. Yeah. So maybe we, we can sort of close this session. Um, uh, I will pass to Sabina for the proper close, but I was just going to ask you. So you think that translation process research has really proved its worth first by collecting all of this data and now creating conditions for us to understand what's going on in the black box of the translator's mind? Well, I would think so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> well, there's scope for more, no? Always. Yeah. There's lots of things that you can still do. Yes. Do you have any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think some of us have the, the pleasure to talk with you further about this. Since this is the privilege of not being online, but um, that's the world we live in at the moment. So thank you all very much for, and uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, and to you, Michael, for giving us this inspiring talk. As you have seen, there's a question, lots of food for thought. Um, and uh, thanks to everybody for contributing and uh, these questions here. Thanks to the online audience for contributing. And uh, 
Well, we will have more convergence lectures, so please uh, hold stay tuned and uh, have a nice evening, night, whatever where you are. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you.